What's up, gangsters? Part 28 of my The Most Disturbing Movies Ever Made series. How about that? That's almost 30. Today we'll be taking a look at the disturbing movies iceberg chart. I I'm just kidding. Um, today's actually going to be a, a rather classy episode, believe it or not. W with most of these titles uh, that I've been meaning to see slash cover as part of the series f for the longest time, I was just never sure as to like when I could like include these, as you know they're just not filled to the brim with like gore and sex and what have you. We'll start our journey in England, we'll stay there for a little while, then move on to France. Which means that we'll start with the beautifully titled The Cook, The Thief, His Wife and Her Lover. Well, if that doesn't sound like four characters that might appear in the movie, then huh, I don't know. Let's take a look. <laughs> Yeah, I brought back the X Minutes Later segment, baby! Well, <laughs> this movie wastes no time, as it opens with a man getting what I can only assume is poop smeared all over him, with some pee for dessert. That's not good. The man responsible for these hijinks is the titular thief, Albert Spica, a misogynistic asshole of a person who runs this fancy restaurant. Don't do that to a woman. I do what I like to a woman. Completely this pick up, well, get it, character. Running the restaurant's kitchen is the titular cook, who throughout the movie provides the thief and his titular wife some serious gourmet shit every day of the week. Now there's only one character left and what do you know, there he is, her lover. With her being his wife and with him being the thief. It's still following? And well, <laughs> that's basically it. The majority of the movie is just Spica blabbering his way through the movie. <laughs> Not often are we treated to such a loud, self-indulgent character. Really, he, he just goes on and on and on and on and on. Much to the delight of his mostly ass-kicking gang of goons, which happens to include Tim Roth in one of his earlier memorable roles. But you're probably like, well, that's that's nice and all, gourmet shit. But is it disturbing? Well, let me start off by saying that this is actually a really good movie. I mean, look at it. It's it's beautiful. We basically have just these these four locations right next to each other, and well, later, later some more. But this sets the way they're lit and shot with this this gliding camera work, giving it a bit of a, a theatrical feel, and all of that accompanied by a, a beautiful score by by Michael Neiman. Man, this this movie's got style written all over it. The disturbingness, I'd say, comes in like like how in contrast all of this is with the vulgarity of our main character. His mannerisms, the way he talks and, and what he says. Did I mention that he is the worst manager ever? You're gonna have to move. We're not moving, we're in the middle of our meal. We're gonna eat quite quickly, you can finish your soup, eh? <laughs> he just does not give a fuck. Fantastic performance by Michael Gambon, but completely loathsome character. For me, I, I, yeah, I guess it was just this, this contrast that made this movie stand out. It's like, don't think of this as a disturbing movie in the same way as many of the, the gore, rape and torture filled titles that we've covered as part of the series. Because it's not. It's as Eve from Letterboxd put it, filled with filth but rich with beauty. I am. Um, I really like that quote. Um, Eve, if you're watching, nice one. It sums it up pretty well. Sure, later towards the end, we get some pretty messed up shit, but yeah, um, I just want you to experience that for yourselves. And of course, if you know even the slightest thing about English history, you'll soon come to realize that this whole movie is basically just one big metaphor, like a commentary on Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher led England during the 1980s. I, of course, hadn't even heard of Thatcher until I read into this movie a little more, so all of this went completely over my head. Fortunately, the movie, I'd say, still works even if you don't catch any of this. So. Yeah, if, if you go in with the right expectations, it's, yeah, it's quite the experience. Um, I'll be honest though, it, it did honestly take me like a few days to come to that conclusion. Like, it, it really is a movie that had to grow on me, which it did, but 
really like uh, initially while wow, watching the, the thing I you know, there, there were some some dull moments, like, I honestly thought it was kind of boring at times. The, really, the, the appreciation for this one, it really only came after like a few days. I don't know, just something to keep in mind. Also, um, remember Tim Roth in, in the movie? Well, 10 years after appearing in uh, The Cook, The Thief, The Wife and His Lover, he made a little movie of his own, his first and only as a director. It's, uh, The War Zone. And... <laughs> Personally, when I think of Tim Rudd, I'm not quite sure why my mind always goes there, but I just always have to think of Ted the Bellhub from Four Rooms. So I was like, how did this guy make a so-called disturbing movie? Well, I, I found out already. Yeah. Written by Alexander Stewart, based on his own novel of the same name released 10 years prior, The War Zone tells the story of just your average, well, of an English family. Mom, dad, son, daughter, they just move from London, you know, the big city, to the countryside, and they're just living their life. Early on, the mother gives birth, and yeah. Well, <laughs> before we go any further, I, I must say that I really enjoyed just how British this movie felt to me. Obviously the lovely countryside, but also the continuous shit weather, the shabby bars, the accents, there's a lot of talk about tea, and just the, the overall kitchen sinky social realism approach. It's a, it's a good movie. But what is it about, you're asking? Just an average, uh, don't say that, just an English family? Well, I don't want to give away too much, I mean, I went in completely blind and that that worked quite well. I, I'd actually recommend doing so, but at the same time, I, I do need to talk about some things. So, well, y you know the drill, just skip to here in order to avoid uh, spoilers. Because, well, from the beginning on, we, we, we feel some, some weird tension. In general, there's some, some peculiar family dynamics at work here. At some point, the angsty little teenage son, I believe he's supposed to be 15, he starts to get more and more suspicious that there's some weird stuff going on between his sister, who I believe is supposed to be 18, and their father. And, well, that's not good. So, when he goes out of his way to confirm his suspicions, we're treated to a rape scene that might be up there with the one in Irreversible. It might not be as long or as violently graphic, but damn is it difficult to watch. So, yeah, that's uncomfortable. Makes for these awkward sibling conversations. Does he do up your ass all the time? Is that the only way you like it? Gotta hate that. But believe it or not, that's far from the worst thing that happens in this movie. You'll have to experience that for yourself, however, as I I really don't want to give away everything. Just imagine some bad shit, and you're probably not far off. So, Tim Rother, are you okay? It's, it's quite a brave project to take on as your directorial debut. Well, as it turns out, Tim Rod is a survivor of sexual abuse, something he opened up about for the first time when he came out with The War Zone, which makes the movie so much heavier as it's, it's such a personal project. Judging it as a piece of art, he definitely nailed it, it's, it's superbly directed, very nuanced despite its hard-hitting topic. It's slow, but very engaging. Sure, it, it, it took me a while to get into, but eventually, like, like in a weird thriller movie type of way, I was on the edge of my seat for, for most of the remainder of it. Despite not really all that much happening, it's just at some point you feel like it's gonna explode at some point, this movie. Simon Buswell, he provides a, a beautiful soundtrack, and to top it off, fantastic performances. And, and not just by, by the heavyweight parents, Tilda Swinton and, and Ray Winstone, but the, the newcomers as well, especially Laura Bellman as the daughter. Really, she gives a huntingly good performance. Plus, we even get a Colin Farrell in one of his earliest roles. I like your accent. Ah, don't we all? Well, that was some dark, depressing stuff. Tim Roth, honestly though, he he handled it very well. Like it's it's just it's it's so real this movie, and at, at no point does it feel gratuitous. It also doesn't offer any moralistic lesson. I mean, it doesn't come with with an explanation because. I guess sometimes there just isn't an explanation. Sometimes life is just shit. 
to date, it's it's his only movie as a director, which is kind of a shame because really with, with the Warzone, he, he definitely proved that he is very talented behind the camera as well. Mm. Anyway, um, that was some dark, depressing shit. Let's see if we can get something at least a, a little more cheerful with our next title. It's um, No Child of Mine. Well, never mind that. No Child of Mine. It's an English television movie, you know, it's, it's, it's made for TV. So how bad can this truly be? Yeah. So there's this, what is she like, like a 12 year old girl? I never know how old kids are. Carrie is her name. She's just a kid going to school, she's in the school band, but she also comes home to her parents arguing all the time and that's no fun. Although compared to what's to come, it's a fucking walk in the park with free cake and unicorns. A friend recently introduced me to the term misery porn and well, this has misery porn written all over it. I mean, let's cut to the chase. This movie is about child abuse. Physical and sexual child abuse. And this poor girl just does not catch a break. From her mother's new boyfriend raping her, to her father pimping her out, to her eventually being placed in a childcare home, where another shady guy gets her into some more prostitution, and one of the fucking social workers has a go at her as well. And I know what you're thinking. Well, th that's a little over the top, right? Classic misery porn, a little exaggerated just to get at us. No. This story is based on the actual life of a child abuse survivor. That's the cherry on top of this misery porn cake. This stuff really happened. Jesus Christ. I've read a lot of reviews of people saying how sad this movie made them. Understandably so, but personally it mostly just infuriated me. It's it's absolutely maddening, especially considering the fact that most of the abusers, both in the movie, you know, in the story in the movie, as well as the real life case, they've gotten away with this. How is that possible? Like, these people are the absolute scum of the earth. How are there so many fucking pedophile child molesters to begin with? It's, uh, see, uh, I'm, I'm getting angry again. Let's, let's calm down for a second. So. It's a TV movie, it's it's no high art. It's adequately made, mostly just well enough to get the story, you know, like to get the point across. Art-wise, it's on a on a complete different playing field from, for example, the war zone that we've talked about just now. But it damn sure gets its message across. A message that, if it wasn't obvious enough yet, is spelled out pretty clearly towards the end. Definitely an attack on the UK system at the time. So yeah, not an entertaining movie in the slightest, but it'll undoubtedly get to you. Whether it'll make you sad or, or mad, a combination of, it's an emotionally exhausting experience. Some absolutely disturbing stuff here. R really, watch at your own risk as it's, well, it's quite the delicate topic. Again, at the end of the day, it's a TV movie, so artistically it's really not very interesting, but this is all about getting its message across. And I'm, I'm not quite sure how the current situation in the UK is, but it's never not a good time to bring to light this uncomfortable yet extremely important topic. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what to add to that. Apparently the real life Carrie ended up doing relatively okay, studying university at the time that this uh, TV movie was broadcasted, but still like, Obviously, she should not have been subjected to these horrors to begin with. The movie itself, um, well, I'm pretty sure it's, 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 it's like very clear as to what you'd be getting yourself into with watching this. So really like in this case, I'll, I'll leave that 100% up to yourself whether or not, you know, like this is something you'd want to check out. So um, for now, let's just leave the UK. What a miserable place that was. And um, move on to France. I mean, classy. Um, yeah, let's see. Well, um, neither of these last two movies are like true French movies, since the first one is actually a French-Italian co-production. It's uh, La Grande Bouffe, which would translate to The Grande Bouffe, I guess? Or Feast. Okay, so the, the one friend that, that introduced me to uh, the term misery porn, he told me that this movie is an example of his least favorite film genre, that being rich old white dudes shouting at each other and spouting philosophical dialogue. 
well, if uh, <laughs> if that doesn't sound promising, then um, I don't know. Let's let's see. Honestly, <laughs> he wasn't far off. Speaking of that friend, he, he recently started a YouTube channel with a friend of his. It's called World of Odd. They do like like podcast like discussion style uh, reviews on, on movies. Check it out. Um, tell them uh, tell them I send you. Which is a shame because I was actually quite looking forward to finally seeing this one. I bought it on DVD years ago. Really, I wouldn't be surprised if this copy has been collecting dust for literally a decade. As I've I've only just seen it now for the first time. And well, well, let's first take a look at what it's all about. So we follow these four rich old white dudes. We individually see them packing for some some kind of event, which we soon find out is some kind of gastronomic seminar, which is basically just, in this very specific case, a fancy way of saying eating yourself to death. Because that's what this movie is about. I, I don't think that that's a spoiler. <clears throat> a group of men go to a villa in the French countryside where they resolve to eating themselves to death. Yeah, that's just what they do. For well over two freaking hours. So, uh, okay. Yeah, we follow these men in this villa. They're, they're very bourgeoisie. With their art and, and literature and music. And, well, most of all, they're serious gourmet shit. They spend a lot of time preparing all kinds of fancy meals. And then, naturally, spend a lot of time consuming said fancy meals. Don't you just love watching other people eat? To spice up this whole eating yourself to death challenge, they invite over a bunch of prostitutes, who seem to be enjoying themselves quite a bit, but eventually lose interesting rather quickly. So yeah, it's a movie about a weekend out with the boys eating food and having sex. Doesn't sound as much disturbing as it sounds like some pretty good post-covid weekend plans. One of the guys, he dies while eating and getting a hand job. I mean, there's there's definitely worse ways to go. So yeah, I, I personally didn't really experience this as, as very disturbing, despite you occasionally running into this title on specific most disturbing movies lists. I mean, I guess the, the concept of eating yourself to death is a little disturbing, it just doesn't make for a particularly interesting movie. Sure, it's, it's somewhat grotesque, disgusting, and yes, it's famously a, a satire on consumerism and decadence and whatnot, but that doesn't automatically make it a good movie. In a way it reminded me of Salo, where I ran into the same problem that just because it has a lot more going on than meets the eye, doesn't necessarily make it a much better viewing experience. Well, if anything, the Marlon Brando Godfather impression was <laughs> pretty funny. It was shot r rather nicely. Uh, although, for every piece of beautiful cinematography, you'll get a poop sound effect in return. <laughs> get it? Because they ate so much? Oh, there. Here's another one. That's very clever. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> okay, well, he, that was kind of cool. I don't know. In the end, I am kind of glad that I've finally watched La, La Grande Bouffe and, and that I've covered it as part of this series. Really, even if just for the fact that we've got it out of the way now. Part of the reason that I hadn't checked this one out earlier is, I, I don't know, I just had this, this suspicion that it was gonna be something that I wouldn't really like, so. Hey, just saying. Again, it's it's not bad per se. I, I don't know, I, I mostly just found it a little boring. Really, like, while watching it, it, it mostly left me just like indifferent, which in turn annoyed me, which all, like it ultimately mostly just made for a frustrating viewing experience. So yeah, um, proceed at, at your own risk with this one. Um, hopefully we can finish up this video with something a little better, which I, I know we can, obviously I'm, I decide the order in which to, we go through these movies. So yeah, um, again it's a, a co-production, this time between France and Austria, which means that after all these years it's finally time for La Pianiste. Perhaps better known as uh, The Piano Teacher, this is surprisingly only the well, not second, the third, um, because we, we did cover both funny games. Um, the third Michael Haneke movie, you know, that, that we've covered during this series. It's, it's honestly, it's, it's one of his most acclaimed titles, so, well, th this one must be good, right? Let's see. Oh, wow, okay, yeah. Th 
That, that was pretty good. Woo. There she is, Isabel Huppert. She's the titular piano teacher who teaches piano at a, a Vienna conservatory. Very good, very strict, hangs out with a very highbrow crowd, very classy. But then she also goes to cheap peep shows where she smells old used up tissues from the trash. Not very classy. She lives with her mother, they seem to have a bit of a complicated relation, but mostly she just goes about her day today. That is, until she meets Walter, the young nephew of, um, wait, who was it again? Anyway, he's young, he's hot, and he's not like other boys, because look at that, he knows how to rock the piano. In fact, he wants to become one of Erica's, that, that's her name, the character Erica, he wants to become one of Erica's students. She's reluctant, but eventually does give in, because, well, look at him. And that's basically it. But, well, obviously there's a lot more to it, but really this mostly is just a character study. And fortunately we have Isabelle Huppert on board because she gives an absolutely fantastic performance. She plays such an interesting character, there's so much depth to her. In her professional environment, she presents herself with high self-esteem, you know, she, she comes across confident, self-assured, bordering on snooty. But as we get to know her better throughout the movie, we learn that she's really not all that confident in all aspects of her life, especially her love, more specifically her, her sex life. Even then, she initially keeps up this persona of, you know, like, I'm in charge, which we witness when she starts a sexual relationship with Walter. Look, it's the poster. She is, however, deeply sexually repressed, frustrated, which she outs in, in some quite disturbing ways, including self-harm. So when she provides Walter a list of what he has to do to her, like with her, it's quite something. <laughs> yeah, you, you thought she was strict as a piano teacher? You should try her as a lover. But this whole self-assured act? I guess it might be, drops as soon as she's rejected, which turns her into a very clingy, um, like undesirable, borderline pathetic, fragile woman, showing her true insecurities. And then when she finally does get what she wanted, it turns out to not be at all what she wanted or like how she imagined it to be, which we get to experience in the movie's controversial climax. Um, I, I know I'm, I'm mostly talking about the character, not so much the, the movie in general, I guess, but oh man, she's she's just such a show stealer. There's more aspect I enjoyed, the, the whole niche scene of, of competitive piano-ing, yeah, how do you call that? It's it's quite fascinating and well, automatically comes with, with some beautiful music. In general, it's, ooh, it's, it's very well made. Besides the performances, obviously, we, we get some great long shots, like there, there's a lot of like long one-take shots in this movie. Disturbing wise, since, well, you know, hey, we are doing the series, I didn't really experience that such personally, but that's not to say that many others didn't. But like I said, I feel that at the end of the day, it's mostly a character study, specifically of Erica's character, but Walter as her opposite really just adds a whole extra layer to it. And as a character study, it takes its time. Literally, the, the first hour or so, it's it's basically just setting up the characters. So yeah, it, it takes its time, but in the end, it sure pays off. Uh, although, admittedly, and I realize that it is like a, like a personal problem, as I uh, I tend to find myself like struggling more and more to like stay focused while watching movies, but um. Comparable to a uh, cook thief wife lover, I th th throughout while watching, I, I found myself like sometimes like getting like a little uninterested, like getting like a little bored, like thinking it was like oh, slowish. And just like with that title, my appreciation for the movie it really didn't come until like like one or two days after. I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying like so if, if that's something that you recognize yourself in like while watching movies, yeah, j still like give it a chance. This one, it's it's honestly really good. It's like I, I shouldn't be complaining about like slow paced movies. In the end, it definitely paid off. And well, that wow, that brings us to the end of this 28th installment of my um, The Most Disturbing Movies Ever Made series. I'm glad we got to cover some of the titles that we did today. I mean, while not as obvious as the, the Salos and the, and, and the Cannibal Holocausts of the world, I do feel like they've deserved a spot on this list, especially with us being freaking 
28 parts deep now already. Part 29, uh, next video will be taking a little trip around the world. And well, after that, it's, it's part 30 already. Um, we'll see. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, beep, boop, beep, boop. All the standard YouTube outro stuff. Um, and then I'll uh, see you guys next time. Cheers, have a nice day.